Hello, Carr. How are you today? I'm good. Thanks, Woody. Good. Thank you for being with us for our, our first episode of Earth Riparian Energy. Um, today we have Carl Faro. He's the Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Serafi Energy. And I pronounced your name wrong again. Faro. Carl Faro. Carl is an entrepreneur with 30 years of international energy sector uh, experience leading project de development, investment, commercial strategy, execution. He's a visionary leader and business manager who has led global operations for major project developers and managed multi million dollar project portfolios in private and state sectors. Uh, does that pretty much wrap it up, or what else you got for us, Carl? Well, I mean, that's, that's a good start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, uh, that's, that's that covers most of it. The good bits. <laughs> well, currently, um, tell us what you're doing currently uh, in the geothermal field, and and then tell us how you got to where you are. Yeah, so um, yeah, so we we've, we've started really a new venture. Um, we sort of fell out sort of six to 12, six months ago, really. Um, it's building on probably over 30 years plus of oil and gas and uh, experience in the energy sector globally. And, uh, you know, one of the sort of key areas that, you know, I find myself in in the last sort of um, two or three years is, is really, you know, what can I do to help support climate change and really help this energy transition more into a, a clean space. Um, but at the same time, do it you know, with the knowledge of skill base I had or already have and what I've learned over the years. And um, and that sort of led me on a path a few years ago to discover geothermal and um, really, you know, raised the question of why, you know, geothermal hasn't been more widely used in, the, you know, the baseload energy um, space to, you know, reduce and help reduce the carbon footprint, being, being as it's, uh, you know, fairly accessible all around us. And, um, you know, it's uh, it's a baseload energy, twenty four seven, um, and uh, it, it's all it's also been around for well over a hundred years. So it's 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 you know being used commercially for well over a hundred years, uh, which really then sort of asked me a lot of questions. Sort of then came to me as you know, you know why and and this and the other. And and when I, the more I sort of investigated and, and got into the details, um, most of the challenges sort of seemed to be jumping out. Seemed to be solutions that oil and gas uh, um, had, had, you know, conquered and, and really developed on over many years, and uh, the, but they weren't and haven't been really applied to the geothermal space. So um, that was really the turning point for me and, um, you know, where, where I really started to, you know, build on the back of that and uh, how we developed and how we set up Seraphy Energy, um, which we effectively founded last year. Uh, and really haven't turned back since. Um, it just seems there seems to be a cascade of opportunity now building off the back of geothermal opportunity. And uh, it's just growing. Um, obviously, we've got a huge challenge in front of us with um, decarbonisation globally. And, uh, you know, we just, you know, we're really excited to be in this space and just great, uh, uh, sort of really fortunate to be able to apply, you know, our expertise and knowledge that we've learned over the last 30 years plus in, in oil and gas to an area which is going to be such a fundamental um, game changer in, in the climate change race as we move forward to 2050 milestones and objectives you know all right so tell us how you how you kind of growing up um you know, maybe like one of the first times in your life where you started realizing these things so so i left i left school with you know just normal great every education with no real ambition of doing uh, anything and then my father had came out one night and said that you know there's an opportunity for an apprentice um fabricator welder at the place he was um working at um do you, are you interested and, and i said yeah why not you know so um i started on that which was a four-year apprenticeship and took me into sort of more engineering degree level qualifications um so i i served you know my time as a fabricator welder um initially um, and then moved more into sort of uh you know i think you know nowadays you know i i done it in an environment which was um really you know hands-on so although it was an apprenticeship it was very much hands-on apprenticeship so 
you know, you were working while you were learning and you learned by making mistakes and by getting things wrong. And, you know, you didn't do it again because you had some big welder shouting and screaming at you, you know, and things like this. So, you know, you generally got things right as you, you learned the hard way to, to get things right. Um, but it gave me a good grounding. And I think, um, you know, it also, you know, made me grow up quite quickly. Um, I think, you know, then probably quicker than normal um, kids nowadays, uh, you know, and I, and I was very young when I first started taking responsibility of supervisory roles, you know, working on oil and gas platforms and things like this, which, again, sort of uh, very quickly put me in a different role of responsibility. And, uh, and I think at that point, I sort of decided that was what I really wanted to do. I wanted to, I wanted to be the guy that was shouting at people and not be the guy that was being shouted at. <laughs> uh, so... I made a decision fairly young that I wanted to take control of um, effectively the environment I was in and, and, and create my own uh, my own destiny. Um, so you know, again, I was sort of I volunteered for everything that nobody else wanted to volunteer to do because I knew that was a way to get up the ladder, you know, and get recognised. And uh, and I I was quickly doing that. So at quite a young age, I was you know a supervisor, supervising projects, and uh, you know probably at a lot younger age than. Uh, than a lot of people today, um, but that, yeah, that's really you know my my starting point in life in 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 the industry. That makes sense. So, what about the environmental stuff? You know, like did you have um you know epiphanies? Like, did you was something by the ocean, or were you? Yeah, I mean, I've I've always I literally always lived my life around the ocean or close to the ocean. So, I mean, no more normally than a few miles of the ocean everywhere I've lived. Um, and, you know, the oil and gas industry in general has is, is, is made that possible. So, I mean, I've, I've been fortunate to travel around the world and, um, you know, I haven't had, you know, it's my well, third company now, which um, I've set up, uh, you know, haven't had companies and being able to travel around the world, live in different locations and, work in different locations, primarily coastal, working in fabrication yards, which generally are on the coast or, you know, working offshore platforms, you know, mobilizing from platforms and things like that by boat and things. So I've always been, you know, connected to the sea, um, you know, and, you know, and, and I've always been very, should I say, conscious of the environment of the sea. Um, so, you know, I've always had a great fondness for marine life and I, I wear my sea shepherds, uh, Hoodie, yeah, I love and, that. Uh, you know, yeah. all of their, uh, you know, the environment in, the, in that side. But um, yeah, I think in general, I mean, you know, a few incidents in my life have sort of really stood out. It, obviously, the Piper Alpha disaster in in the eighties, which was a sort of major um, offshore incident in the UK, which uh, was a sort of bit of an impact change at one point. Sort of saying, "Well, do I really want to be doing this? This is quite dangerous," and it sort of brings home the reality of what you're doing. And then you get sort of incidents like, you know, BP Horizon and stuff like that, which, you know, obviously brings uh, the reality of what we're doing to the environmental side. But actually, when you work in the industry, you actually realize, you know, that it's actually going on a lot more than you really do see. And we hear about it on an everyday basis. You know, it's sort of, you know, these leaks and what's happening and, you know, pipelines leaking and, and actually oil leaking naturally out of the seabed, you know. People forget that, you know, we, you know, oil leaks naturally out of the ground. It's not something, you know, you don't have to drill a hole to get oil out of the ground. You know, in the sea, there's, there's, there's more oil leaking in the sea naturally through just venting out of the seabed than there is of anything that's ever happened, you know, from a any form of catastrophe we've had in, in our, you know, um, history of oil and gas. So I think things like that sort of stand out. But I think the most, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, being conscious of the environment in general has always been, something I, you know, I have sort of taken notice of and I've always been sort of conscious about, you know, what we what we do and how we do things about, you know, treating rubbish, buying stuff. Um, you know, I've never been one to sort of buy buy things for the sake of buying things. I've always been trying to salvage things, you know, repair furniture, do stuff like that as much as possible to actually try and uh, keep as much as possible without spending uh, stuff on new resources. So and I think that's a, that's a great part. And you learn that through the energy industry i don't think there's any energy sector or any any sector in the world that is more conscious of um the environment or you know although they we're ridiculed for it in the oil in the energy sector and oil and gas i don't think there's any sector that actually has probably done more to try and 
reduce the impact on the environment than probably the oil and gas and energy sector in general, you know, so, you know, um, but there is always this um, energy transition and, you know, this is what we're in today. And, uh, you know, we, we have to find ways, you know, it's our, ourselves, mankind have created the problem through demand of, uh, of, of energy products like oil and gas. You know, we're the, we're the people who want things all the time. And, you know, all, all the energy sector as we're doing is really responding to that uh, consumer demand and uh, producing more oil, oil and gas and things like that because there's a demand for it, you know. So I think what's made me more conscious is the fact is is, is really, you know, to make an impact change on on the demand, you've got to use less as, as a person and uh, want less as a person. So this is really where, again, where I've really focused my efforts over the recent um, years uh, is really to try and let, live with less. Or going, uh, and, and, going back to know. that demand, demanding alternatives as a consumer. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, we 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 generally live as consumers, and uh, and 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 we we want for things all the time. So, you know, you know, even you know, products that we don't necessarily even need, yeah. uh, we generally go out and buy, and yeah. just because they're there. If we if we you know got if everyone in the world got rid of you know just stop buying one piece of clothing a, a year, you know, the impact on that would be massive. You know, right. or one. You know, and these are the sort of things that really have made me. So, I, you know, now I buy second-hand clothes. I buy, you know, right. I, you know I, I'm, I'm not, a, you know, I'm, I, I buy things that I like and uh, I don't buy generally new stuff um, right. anymore, even though you know, it's not a case of having the means to do it. It's a case that I don't need to do it, you know. So let's let's dissect that a little bit. First, give us um, your education. I know it sounds like a lot of it was in the trenches. You probably had some mentors and, uh, things but did you you have a formal education college education as an engineer or how did that come about no i actually went to um i, I went to normal school I, I got my sort of um gcse's uh i done my apprenticeship which is effectively equivalent to a sort of hnc a high national degree uh and then i done an open learning sort of um open university uh engineering um side which topped that up uh again working offshore and working you know have as a young family and everything else, like most people do. So, I mean, I, it was a case of sort of cramming education in, you know, further education with work and et cetera. But, you know, I, I, I literally, you know, most of the case of the education, this is something that I still do a, a lot of ambassadorial work for now is skills and training and development of, of um, you know, of, of people. Uh, I think, you know, investing in people is the biggest asset you have. Um, you know, we, you know, we, we as a company have, you know, have built our ethics around people. You know, we're very much a people business, and uh, I'm, I'm one for me at really looking at, you know, what attributes somebody can bring, as opposed to looking at what they have in the qualifications. You know, I think uh, life experience, what people do, and how they deal with challenge is um, far more credible than, you know, somebody uh, who, who's got, you know, lots of lots of qualifications. Uh, absolutely not knocking the, the academic side because that's obviously fundamental as well. But I think, you know, there's a lot of people with uh, who, who lack opportunity um, and have, you know, great, great ability, but lack opportunity. Um, and, and sometimes that opportunity is not always there. You know, it's easy to say, well, you have to create your own, which is probably what I would have said a few years ago. But, you know, sometimes and having traveled around the world and seen different cultures and different areas, you realize or soon realize that actually opportunity isn't there for everyone. Right. And uh, you just realize how lucky you are sometimes to um, be in the position to make the most of the opportunity that's actually uh, presented to you. Uh, and you also realize when you haven't made the opportunity, you know. Right. Well, let's dissect the, you know, the, <clears throat> what do you think? I mean, we, you talked about a closed loop system. And to me, this is, this is one of the biggest issues with the fossil with the fossil fuel industry. Again, I'm not a hater. I, I use it ever. You know what I mean? Like it's not it's not evil. It's it's if anything, it's imbalanced. And I have a philosophy. It's not really a philosophy. I think it's pretty straight on. Like it's an open loop system, and we're not mm. accounting for, and the consumers aren't paying for the true what I call true cost accounting. Of, of this open loop of the, the unintended consequence, if you will, of, 
of the carbon and the heavy metal pollution and the smoke and the carcinogens, um, which seemingly were pushing off on the healthcare industry. And I believe, mm -hmm. I think in Europe, you guys pay quite a bit more per gallon for gas. And if we were, you know, if in, in, in America, if we were paying eight and, you know, I've seen estimates of the true cost being around eight or $10 a gallon, obviously we wouldn't be acting the way we are. We would change. No. We're innovative people, we're hardworking, Texans, you know, everybody, like we would just change our ways. Like you said in the beginning, we would ride bikes more, we would walk more, we would localize, our farming would be more localized instead of big ag, which would probably be a good thing for our ecology, you know, and, and so talk a little bit about that. Like, what are, what do you see as being our biggest problems? Do you agree with that assessment? And then we can move on to the solutions. Like, what are the what are the biggest problems? I asked you about the ocean because I watched Seaspiracy um, a couple of nights ago, and I'm sure you've seen it. And you know, the, speaking of uh, you know your your heroes there, which are also also mine, yeah, the, uh, that that you know they were in that show. They had a, a, a few um, minutes that they they gave to them, and it you know besides that, like obviously there's big things going on. One of the things that that movie showed me was the carbon footprint of overfishing the mm -hmm. oceans is worse than burning oil. And I yeah. didn't realize that, but to me, it's the burning of oil that's allowing for that to happen because it's cheap enough for the ships to do what they do. And again, we're not paying the true cost of that. If we weren't, would the J Japanese be coming all the way over here on the other side of the earth? Would it be economical for that to happen? Would they be taking better care of their own fisheries? Not to point any fingers at any any country because I think every country kind of overfishes and does do things wrong with our fisheries, but maybe tell me what you think about the three kind of, we talked about global warming, climate change. I call it climate chaos because we just mm. went through, you know, the snow, the snowpocalypse that we went through in Texas, um, which is very rare, but it was really cold. It wasn't warm. And so I've, I've just started kind of calling it climate chaos because that seems to me what's happening as a whole. And then talk about like, okay, so climate change, we have plastics in the ocean. Tell me about what you think maybe your three, our b three biggest challenges are as, as human beings. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll sort of refer back to what I said a little bit earlier. Like, you know, I think Whatever, whatever we try and find us or point fingers at as being a problem, uh, the only solution is down to each individual and in, individual people. Um, you know, as as people, we, you know, we've 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 developed a, a natural instinct to want want things in general that we don't necessarily need, and uh, you know that need or that want has created a. I think it's just a, 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 an unsustainable um, loop of um, waste. Um, you know, if we look at generally what we buy and what we, you know, how we use it, everything nowadays has got a disposable value. Um, you know, you would never think about buying a, a you know, a, a Philips TV in the 1970s that lasted two years and then throw it away. You know, and this is where we, this is the life we live today. Is like everything's built for, to have a shelf life of, a minimal period of time which then creates this unsustainable environment and uh you know people while whilst people continue to buy cheap goods or buy things that last one use or single use or whatever and it, you know can go to even things like televisions and videos i mean video recorders in europe are, you know are that or dvd players in europe are that cheap nowadays you you could buy one every year and throw it away and, and and, and unfortunately, that's the mentality people have, and, and unfortunately, you know, we we get that. Is that a result? Uh, because it's of, a consumer. Is that a result of not paying the true cost? Do you think? I, I think it's just a consumer-driven market. Uh, you know, we we we're driven by, you know, small small items that you know generally are meaningless. I mean, if you think about, you know, look at look at the concept of you know nowadays of being able to go and subscribe to Spotify or Apple or and download iTunes and have all your music online. Uh, everyone's going, well, that's great because you don't have to buy CDs and we're reducing all that plastic. But nobody thinks about all the data centers that need to be built now around the world to store all that data use, you know? And that data center uses probably 10 times more energy than 
producing one single CD. So, you know, it's all, all the consequences of this thing moving forward and people are not really, I don't think, I think a lot of us to do with people are uneducated in the real impact and uh, the environment and things like Seaspiracy, you know, they, they, they don't, they don't, they don't generally deal with the problem, but they're, they're raising the problem. And even in that, you know, the problem at the end of the day, the solution to the problem was don't eat fish or don't eat meat in the cow that's, that's, a hard, that's a hard sell to Japan who has only so much arable land. Yeah. Yeah. You know, again, but again, it's all about, you know, I, I'm a great believer of, um, you know, it's all about moderation. And, uh, you know, if you do anything in moderation, you know, the, the impact is going to be a lot less. And, you know, it's about, you know, moderating what, what we eat, how we buy things. It's not saying don't do it, don't eat meat, don't eat fish, don't, you know, it's, you know, we, we shouldn't be doing that either. I mean, telling people what they should and shouldn't do is not the way to solve the problem. It's just for everyone to do a little bit less of what we're doing today. Right. That in itself could make a massive impact, you know. I just wonder how many plastic bottles would, would be purchased if we were paying for the true cost to clean them up, the energy cost, the, you know, that if they were 50 cents a piece without the water in it, and then you had to pay a dollar for the water. Like, I just wonder if we, if we were to charge $10 a gallon to gas, obviously we would change our ways. And, you know, the problem is, I guess, figuring out where to divvy up that money, right? Where does it go once you're charging? I mean, does it go to the healthcare industry? Because that's what's being burdened so much by the smoke and, and carcinogens or, you know, and then bankrupted in essence by just extremely unhealthy human beings or you know, basically chronic disease, the, the onset of chronic disease uh, is being contributed to by just the smoke, you know, simply. Yeah. And, and so if we can get rid of the smoke and charge for it, and then also place a value on forests, like we don't, it seems to me we're not placing a value on just leaving things alone. You know, how much, what, what's the best carbon sink in the world it's a, a forest or a prairie grassland with you know with biomass on top of it and buffalo roaming on it you know those are those are the best carbon sinks like how can we do we do it through carbon trading do we do it through you know how do we account for those costs and i think in the eu you guys are doing carbon trading right it's and so well we you know we're, we're, we're looking at carbon offset and, and decarbonization of existing carbon you know footprint effectively and uh you know the, the the thing is again it's 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 look you know we've created a society where you know the, a, a revolutionary sort of change came in the 50s 60s with plastics and that came into into the mix and uh, and also the sort of change in in general of people's general economy sort of changed in that in that time and uh, I think we realised if you look back in the even the you know the late um, 1900s where you've got you know uh, people making statements about, you know, if we don't change our ways regarding fossil fuel, burning fossil fuels, you know, the earth's going to warm up by at least two to three degrees in the next hundred years. I mean, people were saying that back in the late 19th century. Evidently, so, Exxon Mobil knew that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a new thing. So, I mean, it, unfortunately, you know, it's only when the impact of the consequences actually start to come home that people start to raise and, and, and want to do something about it. And, and I think we're, we are at that point now. And I think, you know, the younger generation and even, you know, even my children and my young kids, I mean, they're, you know, they're, they, they see their consequences and they are now a lot more conscious of, of, you know, what's going on than even we are, to be honest. And uh, I think that's the sort of bit that sort of, again, helped uh, in our transaction is really, you know, we, we didn't, you know, we haven't set the company up to, change the world in a way that, you know, we're going to do it alone. Uh, what we've done is made a sort of effective, uh, uh, effectively an effort to change the change what we can do for our own, uh, and, and do it in a time frame that's doable in the time frame that we can do it in. Um, you know, so a, a realistic, should I say, shift in, in what and how we do things to try and, you know, uh, at least set the ground the ground work for other people to build on moving forward and i think that's a, that's an important shift you know somebody's got to start the process it's nobody just blame it on everyone else and nobody point right. fingers if you haven't got if you don't you know if you don't come to the table with solution don't come to the table right. you know because yeah. there's no room there's no room for more pointing fingers i mean 
you know, some great, great advocacy in the world with organizations like Greenpeace like this. But they, you know, from my opinion, they just get behind the wrong message. You know, they, they, they point the finger at, at one, one problem, i.e. oil and gas or something else. And nobody ever comes to the solution, you know. No. So, you know, you can't just you cannot just stop using fossil fuels. No. You cannot just stop. You know, you, you, you've got to find a solution and the solution also has to be sustainable. And when I say sustainable, it has to be a solution that provides a commercial value, because yeah. on the other hand, you can't stop. You can't suddenly expect somebody who's making a, a living, funding, creating jobs, creating all the other benefits from making money because something has to stop. If you can't find an alternative way for them to benefit and keep that machine moving to support jobs and to do all the other things, they're not going to do it. And um, yeah. and unfortunately, that's the situation we're in today is just too many people pointing fingers and, uh, you know, at the problem, which we know the problem exists, but not many people actually coming out with the solution or willing to stick their neck on the line to provide the solution. And this is the bit where we, as, as a company, we, you know, we just made a, a combined effort and just said this, you know, we need to do something about this. And actually, we can do something about this. Right. Um, you know, you know that's really what we've done. And I think we've seen a big movement in the geothermal space in the last 12 to 18 months that I can guarantee it wasn't there two years ago or three years ago when I first started looking at this. And it's there now because actually, you know, people like us have been making a lot of noise about it. We've been saying it is doable. We've been saying it can be commercialized. We can say it can help climate change. The more you say this in a political way, in a, demo, in a democratic way, over time, people are going to start listening, people start believing. And, I, you know, we don't have to go out in the streets campaigning for geothermal to make somebody use it. We just need to demonstrate that it's got commercial value and it is a solution. And people will start using it. And that's really what we've done. Is So you can be an activist without physically going out and activating, uh, should I say, or cause an activation of problems in other people's lives. Um, you can be a, you know, an activist, a good activist, and that oh. actually solve problems. Right, and or yeah. just vote with your wallet. You know, like both, both like you were talking about, like don't spend money on wasteful yeah. things, repurpose things. Um, you know, I, I witnessed firsthand standing in line for my first Tesla I bought five years ago. The line was an hour and a half long, and I, I literally was like, uh, this is consumer sentiment changing right in front of my eyes, right, right here. Yeah. And for this is here. Everyone's been saying the demand is not here, denying that there was a demand for it. And, you know, look at what's going on now. They can't, they literally can't keep up with the demand. You know, so, um, so energy is our, is our subject. You, you brought up geothermal. That's what you guys do. Um, I've been in the energy industry, mostly in renewables for the past 10 years, eight or 10 years. Um, you know, hydroelectric is even considered renewable, right? It's a, or at least sustainable, if not if not renewable. But um, you know, when I was in the as a kid, I took a tour of Hoover Dam, and you can go down in it. And I saw the large turbines for the, the first time in my life. I'd seen such a, a powerful engine, you know, or a generator producing electricity, and then kind of saw the firsthand the, the the transmission lines going to Vegas and then the lights lighting up in Vegas like oh this is the connection this is how this works you know and so um and through the past few years I've been in solar and wind and and just in the trenches in a lot of these different industries obviously there's challenges there um with variability of, of uh, you know power generation as well as is the sun doesn't make energy at night on solar panels, right? And the, when the wind's not blowing, we're not making energy. So you talk about base load energy with geothermal. Speak a little bit to that. Like what is base load energy? Just define that for our audience. Yeah, I mean, basically anything considered base load energy is an energy that's available effectively on tap. So it's available when you need it, um, you know, and um, there's very few energies outside which are currently driven by fossil fuel, i.e. gas, coal, etc., oil, um, biomass, and these types of things. Uh, you know, with with the uh, you know exception to nuclear, which is probably green. So nuclear is probably today, I would say, the only real energy source which is considered baseload, which is also considered renewable. 
Um, I mean, you could consider things like, you know, hydrothermal or, or you know, or hydro and these types of things is, is somewhat base load because you do have a continual supply of energy. Um, but again, if, if the water stops flowing and uh, you can't flow your dam or you can't produce, you, know, you have to stop the energy. Where, so, I mean, base load is generally considered a 24 seven energy available, you know, as you, as you, as you need it, um, as we know it today. And are fossil um, fuel peakers, are, are the peaker plants considered base load? Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of the, you know, the fossil fuel plants generally are base load. They're supplying a, you know, general feedstock all the time to supply energy. Um, you know, the only, the only difference is with these, again, they are part, big part of the carbon emissions problem, as we know today. So, you know, uh, we, you know, unfortunately, no matter how much money we've thrown at the renewable energy space over the last 20, 30 years, um, you know, globally, we've still got a huge challenge on our hands to decarbonize the rest of the 70, 80 percent. We've still got to decarbonize. And that's, you know, without looking at the added challenge of, a, you know, a growing uh, international headcount of people, which, you know, in the next 20, 30 years is probably going to grow by at least another billion plus people. So, you know, on top of trying to fight a, a climate challenge of converting what we have today to a, you know, renewable energy source that is non-fossil fuel driven you know we're also having having a massive challenge of adding additional energy to economic growth in places like africa india and these sort of areas where their head count is growing on a daily basis so um yeah it's 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 we we have to have a base load solution um you know uh, in as you mentioned intermittent uh, energy sources from wind or solar um, you know, are not going to solve the problem uh, that, that we need to solve in the next 20, 30 years, you know. And, and you mentioned the data data centers, you know, Bitcoin, that, that whole thing about, you know, you buy Bitcoin, you're, you're buying energy use, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're using energy constantly with those, with the data center that runs, runs the logarithms, right? And, and so where do you get the energy from for that extra, we know we need to crunch data because that's where we can make the biggest changes, right? With with the AI and with autonomous learning and robotics and everything else, we can make the biggest changes there. So how do we how do we power those data centers? And we're going to need that. I'm, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'm watching. This the is the one. Go ahead. Yeah, this is one of the big challenges. Is, is um, you know we you know. I've, I've had comments like, you know, data is the new oil and stuff like that. And, uh, and I, I do honestly believe it will be, you know, moving forward, it's going to be more expensive to buy a, you know, a, a, a megabyte of data than it will be to fill your car up if we carry on um, as we are. Um, you know, it's already not cheap to buy data, as we know, even cell phones and stuff like that when you travel abroad. So it's an expensive commodity to buy data and uh, cell phone use. And, and the more we move forward, we're also moving into an environment where, you know, our whole life is being controlled by uh, a cloud or by something that's stored somewhere else in, in you know, off, off our appliances. And uh, that will go for every industry moving forward. So even energy, you know, before sending energy through the sky, uh, you know, they're tested technology to do that so we won't you know in the future we won't be seeing energy sent through cables and wires and stuff it will be sent from one pod to another for a, some form of cloud-based uh, transmission system you know um but you know again it has a huge demand on our uh, on our assist on our environment um and you know the problem with data centers is because they are you know storing a lot of energy themselves with um you know servers run 24 7 um, you know, they require massive amount of cooling and cooling as is heat is a, you know, a huge demand on electricity. So, you know, it takes about 1.5 times more energy to produce cooling and heat, in it, you know, from your megawatts than it does for just to use that for, for electricity. So, yeah, I mean, we have a big challenge there. And as we start moving more into AI and we start getting more of, a, you know, electric vehicles, uh, you know, people talking about flying cars, all sorts of other things that require you know, sky-based uh, systems, um, you know, we are going to be looking at masses of energy. And I've had numbers in the tens of thousands and more, hundreds of thousands more of, uh, data systems required around the world as we grow. Um, but I also think things are becoming a lot more modular. So, 
as we you know move forward we won't be seeing you know massive uh installations of energy or or anything moving forward i think things are going to become more localized and become become more sort of hub based uh, solutions uh, to energy like pods of uh, of energy or information rather than massive distribution system so i think there is a sort of slight swing also in that area as well is that you know people are looking for scale and if you want scale it's got to be modular it's got to be plug and play and it's got to be something that um you know gives us a solution that uh where we need it when we need it uh and 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 also affordably you know so let me ask you about I, i've actually my team and i photographed in one of dell's uh large data centers and you are correct like it takes so much energy to um, run that place, just the air conditioning. And, and then they have these huge, it was Dell's biggest, biggest data center, undisclosed location, like no signs, nobody. And then they had on top of that, they had four huge diesel caterpillar backup, um, generators, you know, with just massive engines, the size of, you know, locomotives. I'm pretty sure it's like the same engines, right. That they're in there. Of course they have to keep fossil fuels on hand just in case and then you have you also have a shelf life for the fossil fuels right they don't they don't i guess diesel lasts longer than than regular gasoline but but so they're having to you know constantly kind of chase that tail of, of just just for a backup system you know to to run their their system so so tell us that i think this is a great segue tell us um I, you know from my point of view and being in the industry being in energy and kind of in the trenches and you know i've got kind of some unique optics we've we've kind of been on the outside looking in and yet also in the trenches and as as uh, professional you know voyeurs and visionaries we we are tasked with studying and researching and then documenting these things in order to to allow the view, our viewers or our audience to understand and kind of you know, wrap it all up in a succinct message. Um, and, and on my travels, I've just, I'm like, oh, we, you know, this is a fast train to nowhere. Like we have to do something quick. And, and I, I do see a lot of promising technologies. And I, I have to say, when I, when I found geothermal and Neil and I connected on, on LinkedIn um, and I started doing some research and you know, I started seeing how the base load energy uh, it fits the what you were talking about just a minute ago is a, a distributive energy model, correct? As opposed to the centralized. So we're, we're we know we need to. I think everybody in the energy industry knows that we need to decentralize the systems in order to reduce rolling blackouts to localize. It's it's literally the libertarian kind of ideology in, in America. If you're if you're not a Republican or a Democrat, you're a libertarian. And so I've always seen that as like, you know, empowering local communities, empowering homeowners, because you can have a geothermal system as a homeowner. And, and so tell us a little bit about, um, you know, how this is going to happen, how it can happen. You know, I look at Tesla right now building one of the biggest factories in the world in Austin, Texas, right up the road. I, I follow it every day and they've got a, a natural gas powered peaker plant in the background, steaming, you know, co cooling things off and with the big Hertzigs and the the huge GE turbines. And, and you can kind of see that, well, that natural gas fired power plants are pretty much going to be powering the Tesla plant. And it kind of goes against Tesla's ideology yeah. or, you know, their mission statement, which is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. And it makes me wonder, a genius engineer like Elon Musk, why is he, why did they not build the, or why are they not building the geothermal plant right next to it? I looked at the map that you guys showed me of Texas and how, you know, the energy is accessible, that the, the Tesla plant is fairly close to one of the, basically, which runs along the Eagle Ford Shell play. Um, which is where the geothermal, where the, I guess it's like three kilometers. Is that right? I bet the band that, that comes up, you need to go down to three kilometers. So tell us a little bit about, you know, in, enlighten us on how geothermal is going to save the world. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, basically the, you know, the, there's a misconception about geothermal, um, you know, and where it starts and where it finishes and what it really is in most people's eyes. I mean, when you talk to the average person about, you know, geothermal, they will immediately 
think about you know ground source heat pumps uh, and that sort of environment and uh, and when you speak to people who know a little bit about geothermal they'll generally you know think that well, that's only doable in places like california or iceland or other areas where you've got geological conditions which are suitable for that um you know our, our sort of journey starts again going back to oil and gas i mean we we've drilled millions of wells around the world over the years and onshore and offshore and every single one of them has heat in the hole in the well um so we know that by drilling uh, deep enough and the deeper you drill the hotter it gets um everywhere in, the, in around the globe and, and the energy is everywhere so you know un unlike um uh, ground source heat pumps or the ground source heat pump environment traditionally when you talk about you know heating for homes or, or or farm buildings and stuff like that which is generally done and has been done for many many years uh and that's very very proven as a is a is a technology from a that's, point of view of deploying to clarify heat, you know? for our, to clarify for our audience that's the heat pump kind of uh, ideal right where you use a heat pump yeah that's the heat the height when we talk about heat pumps we're talking about systems that are drilled into the uh, you know several meters um and then a you know a, a, a system a, a pipe with system put in the ground which basically takes the hot solar energy from the sun which is the earth the earth's crust effectively getting warmed up by the sun i mean even even when you're freezing cold temperatures you know you can dig down you know you can be freezing on the surface but you know, you dig down a you know a meter, and you, and you might be a few degrees. You know, so you know, you don't have. Of, is that's a th result of thermal mass, correct? In well, it's a thermal energy. It's a thermal energy coming from the sun, which is warming the heat of the earth, and that earth is then contained. You know, that heat's contained in there, and then you've got geothermal, which is a it's another type of energy which is coming from the center of the earth. So that's coming from you know the center of the earth is six thousand degrees plus. Uh, you know, it, it, temperature. It's it, it's hotter than the surface of the sun. So, um, you know, we're sitting on the on the biggest battery you could ever ever imagine, sitting you know in the center of the Earth, and uh, you know that's there all the time, and that's radiating energy through heat through the ground up to the surface. Um, although that energy, um, you know, you know, one percent of the world's surface uh, or globe surface uh, produces energy more than a thousand degrees. So, you know, you only, you only have to go 1% into the Earth's crust and you're at temperatures of 1,000 degrees. Uh, so we don't have to go with that to get energy from our geothermal point of view. We do have to drill down to it. And the difference with deep geothermal as opposed to ground source heat pumps, which is the area we're looking at, is really drilling down to temperatures of, of, of in excess of 100 degrees, really. Um, and, and most of the oil wells drilled around the world in several kilometers would, would be at that sort of temperature. So, you know, once you get to three or four kilometers in oil wells, you would be potentially getting to that sort of 100 degrees area in most cases around the world. That energy then we can use through existing binary cycle processes with uh, effectively taking heat and convecting that heat through thermal dynamics for the use of chemicals which boil off a lot uh, a lot lower temperatures and actually then radiate that energy and produce more energy out of a, at a higher temperature which then enables us to use that energy for turning turbines etc or or for producing heat directly so one of the great benefits of um, geothermal and, and really is probably our main focus point is the use of heat so we know heat's everywhere uh, everywhere we go in you know on the planet we can drill a well and we can get heat and that's uh, that's guaranteed. There's nowhere on the planet that you wouldn't drill to a certain depth and not get heat. Uh, so unlike the wind and the sun, where you can go places and it doesn't, you know, you get no wind or you go places and you get no sun or the sun doesn't shine at night, we can get heat 24 seven in the ground everywhere around the world. And that's really the, the basis of how we've um, focused our scalability and how we have focused our, our focus on technology development within Serafi Energy is to actually optimize the use of that heat under the ground. And the other key benefit is that it's under the ground. It's not, at, you know, it's not in your site. So you, we don't have to cover the countryside in solar panels or cover the countryside in wind turbines or and things like this to develop energy. We have a base load energy, which provides 24 seven energy all day long for over 6 billion years plus worth of energy under our feet. Uh, which we can use to produce energy all day long 
uh, everywhere at any time. And the, or what we're doing at Serafi is finding a way to bring it to everyone commercially and cost effectively in a way that, you know, is, is done so everyone can benefit from it. And, uh, and that's really, the, you know, the mission and what we set out to do with Serafi. And it's using that oil and gas expertise again to be able to do that because all the ability to do the drilling, all the ability to do the subsurface technology and everything involved with that is all come from oil and gas. So it's experience that's already there. It's technology that's already been developed. It's skills that we have all over the world. So every country has some element of oil and gas knowledge base in the country, uh, whether it be through just doing one well or some exploration or whatever, there's still some skill sets around it, around yeah. most countries around the world. So it's, it's something that, you know, we believe that it's, um, it's really something that we, we have ignored and, and we call it the forgotten energy source. I mean, it's, 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 been, it's been commercially produced since 1914, the first commercial plant in Italy, uh, which was done in, in Ladero, the, 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 the Ladero plant. Um, but it seems to have been forgotten. You know, it seems to have been, for whatever reason, uh, not being commercialized to the extent that we really believe it should have done. And there are a number of arguments of, you know, well, it's too expensive. People have looked at it. It's been too costly, uh, too much risk. Um, but I also remember 20, 30 years ago when we started talking about doing wind turbines and solar panels and stuff, and people were saying the same. Uh, you know, people 20, 30 years ago were saying, well, you're never going to stick turbines and solar panels, uh, you know, to be able to scale them up. You're never going to be able to do this and send wind turbines out to sea or, you know, these sort of things, but we've done it. And it just boggles, it's mind boggling that why the same approach hasn't been given to geothermal when it's an uh, energy source that could save our planet and also right. provide a base load energy everywhere for everyone. All um, right, so let's, let's, just, uh, let's back up just a little bit and talk about nuts and bolts for our viewers. Um, so I'm, I'm getting my head wrapped around what a geothermal power plant can look like is it is that five acre footprint 10 acre footprint these kind of micro generation plants that you're talking about is that about the amount of space that it takes up yeah i mean the way i would sort of vision um from a basic point of earth development size is sort of a football pitch basically um okay. an average soccer pitch football pitch um scenario for something in the region of around 20 30 megawatts you know okay uh, Bearing in mind most of the infrastructure, once once the drilling is has been done, uh, and the infrastructure you know under the surface can you know with with technology and materials nowadays you know can last well over a hundred years. Um, you know we're, we you know if you we're pulling wells out of the ground and decommissioning wells in oil and gas that have been drilled in the fifties and sixties. Uh, yeah, some of them come out and they look like you know they're five hundred years old, but others. Others come out and they look like they were put in yesterday. So it really depends on what materials you use. But if you put the right materials in the ground to start with, there's nothing stopping you developing an energy source that's going to last for 100 years plus in, yeah. in, uh, without doing anything to it. And on the top side, you know, the nowadays efficiency of um, a lot of the production systems can be well into 40, 50 years before you probably have to do any major maintenance for them. I mean, so if we get the model right, we could be, you know, installing energy systems now or even converting existing fossil fuel facilities, i.e. diesel, gas, uh, coal, fired power facilities and converting the infrastructure that's already there to oh, be able to wow. run things like geothermal. Um, because all you're really that. doing is changing the feedstock. So because yeah, they're, so, they're, all, they're all steam generation plants. So, yeah, so again, let's, all, go, let's go back to let's go back to nuts and bolts here. Geothermal plant, a natural gas fire power plant, brings in natural gas, piped in, and then it burns the natural gas, heats up steam, heats up water, produces yep. steam that is forced into a big steam turbine, which is basically a jet engine in reverse that yep. is being spun. Um, they're rather large, like the size of my house turbines. But you've mentioned <laughs> that those turbines can be taken down to more of the size, like in a microgrid, taken down to the size of a, a jet plane, which makes a lot of sense to me. Um, being in these things and having to wear the, you know, the <laughs> these machines are very loud, and you need your protective gear. There's a reason why the 
there's earplugs around every corner. And, um, and then that's why when you see a consumer or somebody driving down the highway in Texas, you see off to the left of the highway, a power plant that has steam coming off of it. You really don't see the emissions coming out of the, the smoke, any smoke or anything because it's natural gas. So there's still methane and there's still uh, exhaust, obviously, and still carbon, but not as bad as coal. In the beginning, I thought, oh, natural gas is a solution. It's way cleaner. Well, it is. And until we start adding on all the true costs of fracking and, you know, everything else in the distribution and, and, um, and the non-intended consequences. If you if we start adding those in, it ends up costing more. And then as we see the plants are, you know, they're not um, they're not infallible. I mean, they can fail. The system is, is a fairly precarious system. Um, everything has to work properly. Things can't freeze. The the I saw that the well caps, I guess, or the well some of the valves were freezing out in West Texas. And so the literally the distribution lines were cut off and the natural gas fire power plants couldn't get. And I know all those things can be winterized, but you're talking about you know making things more complicated. When I look at these geothermal systems like you're talking about, it just seems like we're we're kind of uncomplicating the system. You know, so the system instead of burning uh, for our viewers, instead of burning gas to create the heat, you're drilling and then running pipes down into the earth with a liquid inside of them. And this is a closed loop kind of radiator, correct? And, and yeah. does it have to have a pump on it or does the heat itself, the heat exchange, exchange that heat enough to bring it up to the surface? I mean, it's, it's, I mean just a, for the sake of... Um... For, for the viewers who don't know, I mean, there's, there's various different forms of geothermal energy, and uh, we're, we're specifically looking at a very non-conventional or geothermal <laughs> approach, which um, really can be done anywhere. I mean, if, if you use a natural thermal or geothermal hydrothermal system, uh, which is basically contains a, a, a effectively a pocket of water under the ground in a hot environment, which... Uh, if once you punch a hole in it, effectively drill a hole in it, you, you will naturally get vapors coming out from hot steam because you've effectively punched a hole in a in a in an envelope of um, hot gas, hot steam that's coming up from water in the system. Um, our system works slightly different, and them, them, them systems. The reason I mention that is because them systems are conventionally probably the most uh, common and the best way to, if you if you have them, to develop geothermal um, because you know you. They are natural and they they require no uh, really uh, intervention effectively other than being a natural resource. Um, however, they aren't everywhere. So, you know, they're not somewhere. They are a needle in a haystack. So you have to put the energy where you find the system and not necessarily put the system where you want the energy, which is where our solution effectively comes in. So our solution effectively only uses the heat from the ground, meaning we can install our um what we call it a downhole heat exchanger for a better word it's a piece of equipment that basically goes down as you said in a closed loop system and uses the heat from that pacific environment to then convert a a proprietary liquid we use which is uh, confined in a closed loop system so there's no chance of escape or emission that system then boils off into a gas which then releases into turn a turbine or turn a, um, some form of turbine. Um, it then, you know, condensates again or condenses and condensates into a liquid and then put back down to the hole. So it's a continual loop system, needs very, very, you know, minimal intervention and maintenance, maybe topping up a bit of liquid now and again. But, you know, once it's running, it's 24 seven base load. It's uh, designed to run for, you know, months, years on end without doing anything. Uh, and can provide the solution of electricity, but also can provide the solution for things like heat and cooling. Um, because, you know, cooling is uh, effectively a reverse process of heating. So it's, uh, you know, rather than using the hot air that you would get from heat or hot water, you put it through a refrigeration process and use it for a cool air or cool water for cooling. So it, the great thing about geothermal is you can mix the energy requirements to the the production of energy so for every megawatt of electrical energy you produce through geothermal effectively you can multiply that by order of magnitude five or six to get thermal energy so one megawatt of electricity could provide around five to six 
megawatts of thermal energy. Okay. So when you talk about, you know, Texas cooling and the issues with, uh, you know, weeks back where there, there was a cold snaps, etc. You know, most of the people who suffered from, uh, you know, or even died from hypothermia, you know, they didn't die because electricity wasn't, you know, was cut off. They died because of cold. And, you know, if we if we can provide solutions where, you know, heating, cooling and electricity is provided more in, in a localized environment, then you don't have them problems. So you can have give, you know, communities and access to all the three fundamental elements to provide a, a solution for energy. But, at, but adding to that, you know, once you've got that, the, then the hot water, the cooling, you can also add in other things like desalination, which then gives you clean water, which then provides you irrigation and food crop our irrigation and things like that. So you're then starting to create more of a holistic approach to not just energy, but also for food, water, energy is a holistic approach. And, and this is where, you know, the therapy concept comes in a little bit more when we start then looking at the economic benefits for growing economies, places like India, Africa and other areas where, you know, we need to take energy to the places they need them because, you know, you can't go and stick a hundred megawatt power plant in a little village that's only got 200 people living in it, you know. Um, you've got to start small and grow. And by being able to create modular solutions and by being able to create modular solutions with holistic approach to food, water and, uh, and energy, you then start being able to also give people more than just uh, providing them energy. You're giving them the ability to scale economy, grow their lifestyle, develop their lifestyle, and actually keep them in one place. We don't want people migrating to hubs around the world. We right. want to keep people where they are right. moving That's a good forward. Point. Because, and you're, you know, you're literally creating liberty you know, for people, right? You're creating a system of... of a liberty system that I photographed, we, we documented a, a desalination plant at the time as the world's largest desalination plant in El Paso, Texas, you know, it's in the middle of the desert. And a lot of, it was very surprising, you know, that you could, they were, I think they're producing about 14% of their water supply at the desalination plant. But one of the, the things, the problem is the energy consumption, just extremely energy um, intensive process. And so, I, when I saw the geothermal coupled with a desalination plant, I finally had an aha moment of like, oh, that's how a desalination can, plant can actually work when you're not having to power it with fossil fuels, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and again, the open loop system of not paying for the pollutants. And, um, and so, yeah, that was, I kind of had an aha moment when I saw that geothermal can be coupled with, with that. So tell us a little, tell me a little bit about I've got my, my picture of a geothermal power plant. Of like what you're talking is about is just basically a metal building, a bunch of stainless steel, shiny pipes, maybe, you know, maybe shiny or not. Um, it kind of looks very, um, might have some steam coming off of, out of a stack or out of a, a part of the, maybe even sometimes I've seen it coming out of the buildings, right? <laughs> you have steam coming out of, yeah, yeah. of your ears. Well, it, really, it really varies. I mean, you know, depending on what sort of system you're building, but, you know, we, we've, we've, again, we've tried to sort of stay away from the, the emissions process. And uh, so our system being closed loop does not emit any um, emissions. But saying that, you know, a, a natural uh, hydrothermal system, you have to vent somewhere. And, uh, you know, that, the, the venting obviously is, is primarily steam, but you do, you, you know, in the ground, in water systems, you naturally get things like sulfurs and stuff like that in, 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 in the water system. So, when you vent these steam sometimes in the, in the conventional geothermal, although they're classed as, you know, primarily green energy, there are there is some sulfur that might be released and some things like that into the atmosphere. Um, however, our, our system in a, as it's closed loop, we don't have that, that issue. And the other thing as well is, you know, we can, you know, we've, we're finding again, and this is one of the challenges, in, you know, for us moving forward is to find more, I would say plug and play solutions, which can be more aesthetically, um, you know, suitable for the environment. So, you know, you can blend buildings into a natural environment. I mean, we, we, we're working on some projects where we're looking at, you know, in, in, in the center of cities, in the center of towns, is developing a, a, a energy hub through geo, for our geothermal system that, you know, could fit inside an existing building and you wouldn't even know it was even there. 
Um, so it's like, you know, or even in a warehouse, some sort of warehouse building that was in the middle of a city or a town. And, and so, so to be able to create something which you can actually make look aesthetically nice in the, in the environment, or even in the countryside, you know, some in the middle of where I am, say, North, Norfolk in England, just having some nice flint building with a fat roof or something like that. You can actually make an environment and uh, build, uh, make something fit into the environment, which is a lot harder to do with, you know, again, I don't want to sort of pick one against another in respect to renewable energy because they're all, they all have their place in my opinion. And, um, but, you know, you can't necessarily do that with, you know, wind and solar, you know, you have to, you know, you have to put this, the system where the energy is most uh, uh, proficient, i.e. where the wind systems are and where the wind flows in the solar panels, where the sun shines, where you get the most radiation off the sunny day, etc. So positioning in, in, in these systems is quite, you know, quite a significant part of the, the, the challenge in installing them. Um, you know, I, I personally don't see nowadays why, you know, solar panels can't be fitted on every single roof of every single building that we have. Yeah. I mean, that in itself would take a massive energy demand from where we are. And I think, you know, it, it, we, we're not going to, you know, we, we've created a problem which has taken us probably 40, 50 years to get to this problem where we are today. Um, we're not going to solve the problem unless we put at least 40 or 50 years worth of revenue back into solving it. You know, right. it's, That's it's, you know, so, you know we, we can't solve a problem quickly without investing in it. And we aren't going to get a solution that everyone wants scalable, which without investing in it. So, you know, we, we can't have the best of both worlds. We've created a problem. We need to solve it. Um, to solve it, we need impact change. To make impact change, you need revenue and money to do that, uh, which might be the longer game to get a return, but somebody needs to put that revenue and money up to make that change happen. And, yeah. and unfortunately, that's where we are. And the only, the, only, the only way we're going to solve climate change quickly is by investing heavily in baseload energies that are going to create sustainable value and not, not create further impact to what we're doing. So, okay. you know, although nuclear potentially can provide baseload energy, you know, it's, it's carbon footprint for production is just not sustainable. And its cost of per megawatt is astronomical when you compare it to something like geothermal. Right, and, it's, and we still have a byproduct unless... Yeah, we still have a product at the end of the day we need to get rid of. We don't some, know what to do with it. Yeah. yeah, we have so much of it yeah. in the United States. We, you know, like... It, yeah. You take it, you take it, not in my backyard, not in my backyard. Like nobody wants radioactive. Yeah. yeah. Someone's always got to deal with a problem. And you know, the yeah. you know, the problem's always going to be there. And you know, even if we even we're seeing in the US with um, you know, certain wind farms being not to mention names, but being decommissioned, and you know, the solution for decommissioning is just burying. Yeah, you the, know, the and blades and, and that, that's, themselves, yeah. yeah. That's not sustainable, you know, that's not sustainable in anyone's uh, no. book. No, no. So no. We've seen the recycling yeah. systems for solar panels too. I mean, they, yeah. you know, what, what are they going to be in 25, 30 years? There's a, our, our, and it goes back to like my argument of like paying the true cost. You know, did I pay for the disposal costs of my solar panels that are powering this whole, the Zoom chat right now? You know, I don't, I don't think I did. I don't think I'm, I'm paying for the disposal cost because and I honestly don't think there's a very good solution for recycling and disposal of solar panels from what I've seen. And I've, again, kind of in the trenches, but a little bit from off. I mean, I've seen the recycle process and I'm looking at it like, how is that going to be scaled up? Because we're going to have billions of solar panels that need to be recycled. You know, so again, I'm a big believer in the problems of the solution. And it sounds like that's kind of what you guys are doing with your closed loop system. Like, okay, we have this problem of sulfur and this exhaust. How do we, what do we turn that into? Let's, let's turn that into a solution for another issue. And so, so talk about that a little bit more. Um, how did you get to your closed loop system as opposed to in the new system? I know you all have some very unique drilling technology, if I'm not correct. So, so tell me about some of your, your Seraphis differentiators and then touch on transmission because I have this picture in my mind of you know, is it is the energy going to be produced and transmitted in transmission lines? And what you're saying is it well, it can be in heat, it can be in electricity, it could potentially be in steam. Do you transfer the steam to another location? How does that how does that work? 
Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, we, we you know, now, nowadays, I think, um, it's like I mentioned earlier, I think we've got to get away from this, um, this, you know, centralized energy um, distribution processes. And, uh, and that just, that doesn't just go for energy, that just, that goes for everything. Um, you know, I, I you know, the, the, the great thing about geothermal or the, the, the potentially geothermal, but more so in the solution of being able to create it anywhere, which we've created some sort of enabler to do that. Um, it gives us the ability not just to produce the energy where it's needed, but it also to produce a cascade effect from the energy that's produced. So, you know, as opposed to just looking at energy from electricity point of view and sending that to a distribution system or into a grid somewhere, um, like you mentioned earlier, you know, you, you know, every, you know, you don't want to be driving an electric car or a Tesla and then find out that it's been powered on a coal power plant that's been built down the road, you know, or, so, you know, the idea of that holistic approach, the idea of that, um, sustainable values is lost then because you've, you know, you're then driving your battery although, Tesla and uh, although an electric vehicle is eighty percent efficient supposedly as opposed yeah. to a fossil fuel vehicle yeah. which is about twenty to thirty percent efficient. So. But you, you, you're still, you're still, you know, you're still if you if you if you're not powering it from a renewable source, you're still powering that, um, right. you know, vehicle from from something that's generated by fossil fuels. So, right. you know, and, and this is you know one of the big problems of you know, even countries like Poland who say, you know, we've got more electric vehicles than anyone else in Europe. Yeah, but you've got more power plants than anyone else in Europe. Right. Made powered on coal. So, you know, oh, right. um, so, you know, you don't want to be, you know, there's no, there's no value. And I think this is probably one of the challenges I have at the moment when I, when I look at buying an electric car um, and I think, well, if I buy one, I'm not guaranteed I'm, I'm going to be charging it on the, on on the elect, on the, you know renewable energy because uh, I might be buying a renewable energy through my network tariff, but it's a carbon offset somewhere. I'm not. It's probably coming from some gas fired power plant down the road. Right. Um, so again, it's that sort of challenge. But coming back to what you were saying about where energy is, and this is a bit I think where Seraphy is 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 where we're trying to sort of challenge the game a little bit more is. Is you know energy needs to be more more available where it's needed, uh, when it's needed, and in the quantity it's needed. So we actually get more clever about how we use it. And one of the things we've done is, as much as we've invested a lot of time, have technology and patents and various things around the development of the well technology and stuff we're using to create the Seraphy well solution, and also on our top side. Um, development of optimizing the use of the energy in more efficient ways to get more, um, should I say, energy out of smaller packages when you talk about, you know, like jet engine type scale and this type of thing, you know, we need to be getting these packages down to effectively the size of someone's normal garage at home, you know, or some or a, or a contain, shipping container type side, but something that can produce three or four megawatts of energy in that size unit, you know, uh, and that's really what we should be aiming much? how much energy does like how many houses does three or four megawatts power well i mean you know it's, it's really hard to say because you put on average but i mean you know a normal you know three or four megawatts of power are several thousand houses you know um so it's a one large you know you're talking plant, quite a lot. one yeah. small plant can power my whole neighborhood and yeah know, absolutely maybe a, yeah. Three you know, mile mean, radius. Well, a small a small business park would take several megawatts you know so uh you know things like that so you can get quite a lot of energy out of a small hub unit and and the great thing as well is you know what we're looking at is more the private wire solution so you can probably find you know there's communities being built new com new communities being built or business parks or you know factories and things like this where they might say well like, actually i want to get on get on renewable energy but i'm looking for base load you know providing they've got something you know, the size of a football pitch that we can actually go and develop, um, you know, we can provide them their own private wire energy supply. And I think, you know, this is where we're seeing possibly the future move into is more, you know, people disconnecting away from the grid and the the, the, the sustainable, shall I say, approach of, of relying on somebody else to provide their energy. And, you know, we can still do it in collaboration with the energy companies because they, you know, they could still do the regulatory side and still do the, you know, the feeding tariff parts and all the other stuff. But what we're doing is providing the energy solution, which at the moment they haven't got. So in many cases, a lot of the big energy companies are looking for a solution. They have options of wind and solar, 
it's probably not in the area where they really want to focus their their attention and that's what's happened in oil and gas you've got a lot of you know oil and gas companies who really are looking at wind and solar is it's not really the sexy thing in the room it's not it's, it's the option they have but it's not really something that they're knowledgeable about or even what they want to go to but they're feeling pushed towards it because they have to do something in the renewable space whereas geothermal is a lot more connected to their playing field and a lot more connected to the space that oil and gas are used to which is subsurface engineering drilling all the things that they're connected to and, and this is where Serafi is really wanted to focus our efforts is is really to you know use the power of industry in oil and gas use the expertise and experience that's been built up over you know many many years it's one of the safest industries out there when it comes to you know dealing with hazard dealing with risk uh, dealing with not only operational risk, but, you know, investor risk and everything else. And we can really make an impact if we get behind the geothermal space in, in the approach we're taking, which is more of a plug and play modular solution. And this is really where we see as the benefit. It's, it's got to be plug and play. It's got to be scalable. It's got to be something that provides value for everyone, i.e. for the consumer and for the investor and for the operator and the end user. You know, it's got to provide that whole value chain. And the you, only way we can do that by by throwing money at it and by scaling it up and using the same same principles of, and benefits that you know solar and wind have enjoyed over many years when it came to the scene. I mean, I remember thirty years ago when people were talking about solar energy and wind energy, uh, people were laughing in the room, you know, saying we're going to power our you know the, the country on wind in the UK. Now, wind plays a massive part of our industry and business. It's one of you know, the UK has become one of the leading sectors in the world for, for wind energy development, especially offshore wind. And uh, again, it was built off the back of the experience in offshore. We just have to figure out a way to repurpose the blades. <laughs> yeah, this, this is, it's, again, it's coming back to this holistic solution again, isn't it? It's like, you know, we we have to have, you know, it's it's this, uh, you know, I have many conversations on a daily basis where, we, we're trying to get all these different tangents we keep going off into somebody's new idea and bring them into a, a holistic solution which has a sustainable um, value and i think you know we forget that sometimes and, and i think if we can do that in our own life personally you know on an individual basis it would help the bigger scale of um of problems we have and uh you know I'm, I'm not i'm certainly not one for preaching to somebody and say you should be doing this or should be doing that it's everyone's individual decision um, but at the same time you can't moan about the problem unless you're actually playing part and doing something to well, resolve and, it you know? and let's admit we have a problem right that there's so much there's so many um you know we had, we we're home to one of the world's largest gas stations called bucky's i don't know if you're familiar with it but it's yep. i think there's like yep. you know a hundred pumps or something it's just and, and you know when you drive by that and you look at it it just, I mean, you just, any, any um, logical thinking human being, if they look at it, you know, if their job isn't dependent on it, if they're just kind of looking at it from an independent point of view, has got to look at that and go, that's not sustainable. I mean, we just can't do that. And it's Bucky the happy, you know, it's like all packaged yeah, in this, you know. Yeah, well, Bucky's amazing. Bucky's itself has made itself a commodity, you know. Bucky's is uh, right. and it, and it, to me it kind of it it's covers it, it, yeah, it's a it's a colorful little cartoon character that covers up the ugly truth of, you know, now that I have an electric yeah. vehicle, like I don't spill gas on myself anymore, I don't breathe the fumes, I don't I don't step all in this nasty stuff and then bring it home to my house and track it in my house. I don't. There's a, there's so many benefits to not going to a gas station. And people just don't realize that. They don't realize how inefficient and inconvenient a gas station is. Ironically, they're called convenience stores. They're, now yeah. that I know the difference, they're so inconvenient compared to me getting out of my car and plugging it in. It takes me three seconds. I don't get dirty. I don't throw gas in my clothes. I don't, you know, it's, it's again, it's kind of closing that loop a little bit. It's at least making it manageable. The loop, you know, the loop is... I'm starting to look at my loop and my footprint and everything as, okay, and in permaculture, we teach redundant systems, right? So I'm still hooked to the grid and I have my own solar power plant. I would also like to have 
a little water, a battery backup storage system and a little water wheel on my plumbing system. That every time I turn on the plumbing system, the water wheel turns and trickle charges my batteries. Yes, that to me yeah. is a redundant system and maybe a small geothermal plant in my backyard. Or I have a compost pile that's 130 degrees, six, uh, 12 months out of the year, 24 yeah. seven. Can I wrap a hose in my compost pile and get hot water off of it? Of course I can, you know, like that's a- I think also there's, a, there's also a little bit of a danger in trying to sort of electrify everything. I think, um, you know, we, we, you know, even even in our um, sort of geothermal mix, we, we, we call it sort of the energy cascade, which is sort of taking electricity, producing heat, cooling, but also then you, I talked about desalination. I also mentioned about hydrogen. I mean, we also need to sort of, I mean, hydrogen is a bit of a buzzword at the moment, but, you know, the scalability of hydrogen is also quite questionable, especially blue hydrogen, given its um, transportation issues and movability issues. But I certainly think the ability to scale uh, in, in the case of things like, you know, Bucky's and, and these types of uh, locations have been able to provide a blended solution for electric vehicles and provide some sort of hydrogen um, uh, fuel, fueling capacity as well, where, you know, green hydrogen or something like that can be produced as a byproduct of the geothermal energy, the power and everything else is there. That green hydrogen also then allows people who want to drive a, a V8 and et cetera to still drive a V8 and still be green, you know? So I think there's, there's abilities to, to try and do this. I think also there's not, there's not one solution. I also think, you know, we've got to be realistic that there's, there's a number of solutions. Um, you know, geothermal will play part of that and should be playing part of it a lot more. And it certainly is today, you know, we need to be getting a, we need to be getting a, you know, this baseload energy up to at least a ratio of sort of 50% of our energy, um, focus in the next um, 20, 30 years, because otherwise we're never going to achieve the, 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 the swap out of uh, carbon fossil fuels for renewables at the rate we're going with um, the, you know, the wind and solar. And, and I would really, given the, even driving now, you know, you drive through places in Europe and you can drive for hours just through wind turbines, you know, on the countryside. And I would hate to see a world in 30 years time that was, you know, scattered with um, covered in solar panels and uh, and uh, wind turbines everywhere. Yeah. And I think if we're not careful, that's where we are heading to. Right. Um, so we need to find something else. Um, we certainly can't put all the energy offshore um, regarding things like wind turbines because you know it works with an island like the UK, but it doesn't. It certainly won't work for Midwest in right. Texas if you're going to run pipelines in uh, you know from the coast. You know, things like this. So you know, we've got. I think you know, it's a case of trying to come up with solutions that are fit for purpose in certain locations and not just saying wind and solar is the solution because right. that's currently what's being said and unfortunately you know i think even investors are seeing nowadays that you know there's i don't know how many trillions been invested in wind and solar over the last so many years but you know they're seeing the investment is is not comparative to the the, the impact it's making on the climate um, side you know yeah. so yeah. when you look at you know i invested a trillion in this and i've only got <laughs> that much benefit you really yeah. then sort of start to question really where is the value in, in what i've invested you know right and that the I, a lot of people don't understand that you know solar panels the silicon you know that the process itself of building a solar panel you have to have heat in excess of a thousand degrees in order yeah. to in, in clean room situations i've been in the factories before and you know, you can't have hairs and dust and things getting in the in the in the cells. You you have to have this super high heat, so it's still very energy intensive. And then you they last for 25, 30 years. Like, what are you going to do with them when they're done? And can you build a house out yeah. of them? Can you, you know, what are you going to do with the yeah. solar panels? So can they be recycled? And um, so let's talk about uh, storage and transmission a little bit more. So talk about your y'all's system. You talked about the multiple. Um, kind of not just electricity. I like that idea. It's, you know, let's not just be because that feeds into redundant systems. Let's not just depend on one energy source. So, so tell me how many energy sources and, and that you have from one of your plants and then uh, transmission and storage of that energy. How does that work? Yeah, so I mean, you know, I'll start with the transmission bit because again, this is something you know we 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 believe very much in building the energy where it's needed and using it where it's needed. So, 
transmission then becomes not so much of an issue. And, uh, you know, even if you're looking at a residential sort of, um, should I say, residential heating system type process where you might have a combined electric with uh, heat type generation, um, you know, in the UK, for example, in the next uh, five years, we're talking about, you know, decastification of all properties regarding heating systems. So, you know, it, it, that means that everything post 2025 means that any any new property can't have a gas boiler fitted or anything to do with gas. So, you know, moving forward, everything is going to oh, wow. have to be something other than, than gas. Uh, you know, nobody really, nobody really even knows today how it's going to be done. But, you know, the, the line has been put in the sand and somebody said we're not having it after this day has to stop. So we need to find a solution. And sometimes that's the best way to find a solution to is to, you know, put a line in the sand and say from this date, we're not doing this anymore. And somebody has to come up with a solution. And, that, and that's effectively what's happening now. So, I mean, where, where we see the solution is, is, you know, trying to pick the areas which are doable to start with. Um, you know, these things, you know, changing everything at once is not, it's not generally the best way to go. You have to learn to walk before you run and finding the low hanging fruit opportunities to actually start on to actually do some change is always the good, the good starting point. So, you know, finding, finding um, existing, uh, should I say, fossil fuel generated businesses, which or uh, facilities which already have the footprint in place to maybe do a transition to something like geothermal is obviously a good starting point because you, you then learn and you can have the, the existing infrastructure to do that. Um, but again, if you have to run the transmission systems, you want to be putting that energy as close to the, the, the use of it as you, as you possibly can. So you don't have to run, you know, kilometers of, um, of systems to actually connect things together. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, life doesn't always work like that. And you always you have scenarios where you might have to run uh, systems over certain, uh, you know, developments or land, et cetera, to actually connect the dots together. Um, and I, I certainly think it's a lot easier to do in places like the US than it is to do in places like the UK, because, you know, generally the US is built on a fairly standard, you know, uh, square grid structure. So running a piece of pipe in the US or a cable in the US is a fairly straight line opportunity or process. Whereas in the UK, you know, 100 yards and you've hit a, a bend or a corner somewhere in a, a road or, a, you know, you've, you've got to you then move move your um, system around the countryside. And, and in the US, you have more of more of a straight line system. So it's quite easy, I think, to do things in the US from a geology point or a logistics point of view uh, when we talk about running transmission systems than it is in places like the, the UK or even in other parts of Europe, to be honest. Um, and I think every every thing is every system's different. So we you know we have to look at each project differently, and we have to look at you know what are we trying to achieve out of that project in in this specific case. Is it something that can be staged, or a, you know a, a staged approach, or is this something that you know has to be done all at once? Um, because you know first of all, if there's no commercial value to it, then you know, there's going to be no value to anyone to do it. So first of all, we have to make sure that the, the commercial value stacks up. And when I say commercial, it doesn't necessarily have to be a monetary commercial value. It can also be a, a CSR or a EGS type value, or it can be a sustainable value for a longer term type um, benefit um, moving forward. And, and again, we're seeing this even with our systems of, you know, even the use of heat alone in some environments can be, uh, they used to add value to a uh, agricultural type business or a, some sort of environment where you want to use just heat. I mean, the distillery industry is a big one, for example. Uh, you know, there's a huge amount of heat used in the distillation of, um, of whiskies and beers and things like that. And we're working with a number of different uh, you know, companies where we're looking at how do we can use geothermal to help that uh, decarbonisation in the electricity side for direct use of heat. Uh, in the in the the food drying industry, there's a huge amount of energy used in that. So, again, it's, it's picking these big. Once you start connecting the dots with the big off takers, it becomes easier then to then get the off takers connected to the smaller off takers, i.e., the domestic use, the houses, the other things. Because you know you always need someone who's going to take a big chunk of it to make it commercially valued. Gotcha. Uh, if it's if, uh, if it's not commercial, it doesn't. It doesn't have a value in the beginning and you're not going to get people to back it 
and it needs to have commercial value to get uh, funding to back it and, and the ability to commercialize it uh, in the first place. And that, that commercial value could be, I mean, we need base load into our existing power companies, which I live in a little town called New Braunfels, Texas, about 80,000 people, very growing like crazy. Everybody from California is moving here. And, and so, you know, we need more base load energy. I mean, right now, the, you know, then it, the competition is good. So if we had uh, competitive geothermal here in this area, um, I don't see why commercially our New Braunfels utility wouldn't be buying, you know, committing to buying that energy, you know, as long as it's competitive price wise per kilowatt, um, why would they not buy it as compared to the fossil fuels, which obviously have a lot larger footprint and, you know, carbon footprint and pollution potential. And, and so it just totally makes sense that that is also a commercial level, right? For a power company or cooperative to purchase the power from you to have a power purchase. I, I think, you know, commercial, commercial nowadays has gone beyond the, uh, I think the terminology of when we say commercial is just about making return for investors. I think nowadays, you know, it's, it's about making some return for investors, but it's also about doing things more sustainable and more, um, you know, uh, in line with, uh, what the consumer wants. I think the consumer is becoming more conscious about where they do buy stuff from and how they buy stuff. Um, you know, and that's that's going to grow. Uh, like I said earlier, it's, you know, with the younger generation coming through there, they're a lot more conscious on, you know, even the stuff they eat, how they eat, what they buy. Um, you know, so I think, you know, that that in itself is, is, uh, is a natural process that's happening. Um, and I think, you know, in general also, it's about, you know, how we use our stuff we we actually you know you don't have to not necessarily uh, not use gasoline or something to be sustainable i mean you can right. you know you, you you might you might fill your car up once every two months with gasoline and drive you know one kilometer a week you know <laughs> it, it, you know it, you're not going to make a massive um dent on the environment well, by doing that i mean and can know? we capture the 80 percent waste you know, what, what can we yeah. do with the waste from that energy input? I mean, we're, we're to me, that's a, a huge issue. Like, we're just wasting 70% of the energy that we burn from these fossil yeah. fuels. Just absolutely, just their heat loss, right? And exhaust. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think also the, you know, the, the impact stuff that we we do miss on the big elephant in the room is, is again, in, in the, the buying stuff we don't necessarily need. And, uh, you know, I think if we all sat back and thought, I mean, I think, you know, this, uh, the last 12 months through the, you know, the lockdown and the COVID-19 and everything else, I think a lot of that has been a, a lot of reality check for most people uh, in how they were living their lives and, and then how we can live today with a lot less and probably doing a lot less and right. still have probably as much fun and still do the same things or we'll still end up with the same results, but we've right. less spend and less, um, damage and i think you know just the fact is that you know the, the lack or the reduction in air flights in the last uh, 12 months alone is probably you know you only have to look at the you know the the, the carbon um, footprint on the on the earth for that and to see what a uh, what an effect that had so you know just reducing that one holiday a year or that one flight a year or every you know all of these things will have a massive impact and i think right. this is where we've this is where we've um i think we've got to uh, unfortunately, and you know, we've we've had to go through a, a really tough year for most people uh, in 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 uh, lessons learned to actually get here and and to understand the reality check. But I think you know, there's some good things going to come out of this. I think uh, I uh, at the end of it, you know. Well, tell me, um, let's talk about Texas. Um, I mean, who doesn't like to talk about Texas, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I've been, I was born and raised here. I, with some of my first memories are, are smelling, you know, uh, refineries in Houston. I was born in Houston, grew up in Dallas, and I ended up in Austin, San Antonio area. So I've literally been in every corner of the state and traveled all over the place, oil, surrounded by oil wells. I've, I've driven for 150 miles through the Permian Basin with my eyes burning the whole time the whole time like mm -hmm. sick like almost throw up sick and i couldn't fathom this was recently i couldn't fathom living there 
and be living in, you know, there's signs everywhere that say toxic gases, you know, beware, warning. Again, we're not paying for that. The consumers aren't, to me, we're not paying for that at the pump. All of these, every one of those people that are living out in that mess are gonna have some kind of chronic disease or, or another. And not to, again, knock the fossil fuel industry. It's not that, it's just, it's an open loop system. All I mean, there's flares, methane flares everywhere in West Texas, thousands and thousands yep. and thousands of as far as the eye can see. It lights up the sky at night. It's literally as close to hell on earth as I've ever been is in a dust storm in the middle of thousands of flares in West Texas when I ironically got diverted off of the main highway onto these fracking roads because of an oil spill, a, a tanker truck spilled and closed down the highway. And so it, it was scary. I mean, I was, I was honestly, Carl, I was, I've never been more scared in my life than that moment. And I'm in a Prius yeah. driving on these fracking roads surrounded by flames, the sun's setting, the wind's blowing 60 miles an hour. It's totally desertified. There's no life left anymore in the West Texas desert. There used to be a lot. It's kind of been trampled and, you know, poisoned and polluted and, and so this is the biggest play in the United States. You know, we went from, I think we had, what was it? Uh, 2000 injection wells in, in 2015. And now we have 50,000 injection wells in the state of Texas, over 50,000 and counting. There's literally no regulation on it. Um, you know, it's a slap on the hand. It's the good old boy network, which is has its upsides. Like, that's why Tesla moved here because of lack of regulation, you know? So, so again, I believe that if the consumers, if we were paying for that and we understood, but, but I don't even know how we could capture all that. How can we keep those poisonous gases from polluting all of West Texans? You know, how can we, I don't see how we can capture all that. I don't see an engineering solution for, for that situation, it's just literally out of control. It's wildcatter to me. It's, it's what it was like 100 years ago in West Texas. It's just, you know, and then three quarters of the wildcatters go out of business and bankrupt. And then the big guys come in and buy all the wells. And, you know, it's just this kind of cycle and it's, it, it's just out of control. And, and from, from my perspective and what I've seen and being in the middle of the, of the fields like that, um, it's just crazy. So what can geothermal do to help resolve some of these, what I consider to be some of our, our, our biggest issues moving forward? I haven't even talked about global warming. You know, I'm just talking yeah. about particulate yeah. matter, you know, and. I mean, you know, where, where I see, um, I mean, you know, and I have this sort of conversation every day with, with, with different uh, companies uh, around the world and on ongoing projects and various other things. Um, you know, they, you know, there's a lot of um, oil and gas wells, that obviously, uh, you know, as they come to the end of their uh, productive life, um, they naturally get uh, what they call decommissioned. So they get put out of commission and uh, they have to be over a certain period of time in most countries uh, under regulations plugged and abandoned. So that means they have to have a permanent abandonment um, concrete barrier basically put into the well um, after a certain amount of intervention and plugging work gone on. Uh, sometimes, you know, then wells continue to emit emissions and gas and there's really nothing you can do about it. You know, it's part of the infrastructure. If they, the well's leaking from externally from the well itself, it's very hard to do that. And like I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, I mean, there's, there's probably much or more gas and oil leaking around the world naturally from natural resources mm -hmm. that, are, you know, in the, in the ground than there are any anything that oil and gas has ever done. So, you know, in some ways, you know, uh, you know, there'd always be there, even if we killed every single well in the world and stopped uh, producing oil and gas tomorrow, there'd still be oil and gas leaking naturally into the uh, into the earth and the atmosphere, uh, and and creating more problem than than or creating at least the same problem as what we've got today. Um, so, you know, killing oil and gas is not the solution, and certainly. Um, you know, while we still, we'll always need a demand for oil and gas. So there'll always be, uh, you know, whatever we do in the renewable space to uh, revert the use of, or, of fossil fuels for the production of energy, we'll always be using oil and gas for something else. I mean, everything around us 
from plastics to you know cables and polymers and you know paints and chemicals and everything we use around us has got some form of uh, a product from or product related to oil and gas from it so we, we unfortunately we got to the stage now where we can't do without it and unfortunately i think if you asked uh 90 percent of people around the around the, the globe today if you uh if you could uh, get rid of oil or gas or you could uh, get rid of your iphone what, what would you do uh, they would just say well i'll just keep my iphone um and i think unfortunately that's what we are so again all we can do moving forward is is try and reduce the impact of that, i.e. reducing the demand for it, uh, which means, you know, we, we use, everyone try to use less of it, which means if there's less of it being used, there's less demand for producing it. Um, because obviously the more we produce, then we drive down the price. So, you know, like we've seen a few years ago when, you know, they were giving oil away because uh, the market crashed and, you uh, there was too much oil in the market and, you know, the oil price dropped to below and negative. So effectively giving it away. Uh, and if, if markets carry on like that, then that's what will happen with oil and gas. It will become a, a commodity that no one will want. Um, I know, but I don't think that will ever happen. And I don't think, I think what will happen is we, uh, as we move forward and we start to decarbonize the energy sector uh, in respect of renewables, what will happen in, the other side of it is the actual price and value of oil and gas will actually increase, but the production will probably decrease. Right. So we'll be so we'll be paying more for oil and gas products, which means our consumer goods will go up, our price of consumer goods will inflate, and our price of travel, our price of car travel in petrol or diesel cars will go up. But our, you know, I think what that then does is drives an ability or somewhat of ability of consumer choice so if you want to pay more to do something you will do but it, you know that's your carbon offset effectively so right. you know if you want to drive a, a v8 vehicle with a nice sound and uh, running right. on gasoline you can do it but you'll be paying a lot more right. than the guy who's driving his car you know right that's um, why i think we should pay for the pollution i think we'd end up but, and, and, that's one of the costs, you know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, and I think that's the way it's going to go. I think, uh, and I think, you know, we, we are seeing more and more of a, I'd say a, a, a carbon tax scenario where, um, you know, we, uh, you want a good friend of mine who, who passed away recently, um, you know, he was leading a, this sort of uh, climate change um, solution for carbon taxes uh, around the Washington area. And one of the drivers there was the carbon app scenario where you get a carbon app and what you buy what you you know instead of going in and just you know swiping your kruger card in the supermarket you would use your carbon app and what you buy would either give you money or take money away right so you know depending on how you spend how you buy what you purchase will depend on how much money you end up with in the bank each, right. each day you know and i think you know this is where that's, I think that's really you know, that's really advanced trying to get uh Trying to get poor folks on the, south, on the east side of San Antonio to buy into that is, without it being forced on them, is going to be a hard sell. Yeah, well, I think if, you, if you're in a, if you're in a space where you know the average family could could earn money by spending less and by yeah, that's a good point. Uh, you know, yeah. so if you so you know those those who those who can and want to will mm -hmm. end up you know paying a bit more, and those who who can't and don't want to. Will end up actually benefiting. So you know, I think what we need to do here is come up with some system where people are rewarded for um, being carbon negative or carbon neutral, and be penalised for being carbon positive. You know? Right. Um, I think if we if we end up with that scenario, again, it's down to choice, and the consumer has that choice whether you you know you want to go out every weekend in your V8, you know Chevrolet, or whether you don't want to go out every weekend but if you choose to then and that's your uh that's your way of relaxing and your way of playing golf or whatever it is <laughs> to relax then why sh why shouldn't you be able to do it you know right. i don't i don't believe that somebody should be penalized and not be able to do something because it's it has some effect everything you do has an effect so to somebody right. you know well so yeah i just looked up um wells let's come back come back to texas um we have it looks like 159,000 wells approximately in texas and 6200 mm. abandoned wells 
um, according to the Texas Railroad Commission. So tell us what Seraphy yep. could do with those abandoned wells and how that would help. And then talk a little bit about scale. We haven't really gotten to, you know, how long does it take to build a plant? Is it scalable? Like how many would we need? And if you, if somebody wrote you a check right now, Carl, and said, how much money do you need to build the amount of, of uh, geothermal plants, Seraphy style geothermal plants in Texas, how much money do you need? How many plants would that be and how long would it take us to, to build them? Yeah, I mean, if, if, if we were, I mean, if we're looking at retrofit and what exists and, you know, just taking out a rule of thumb of saying, you know, we could get, say, maybe half a megawatt out of an existing well um, that's already there to be abandoned and you've got 6,000 wells, then, you know, that's three gigawatts of energy straight away um, that you could potentially get um, out of them 6,000 wells. So three gigawatts of energy is 3,000 megawatts of, of power. Is that per day or per? Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's per day. That's per hour, per, oh. per minute. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. It's what's excessive. So, okay. so, so, you know, so, you know, it, it has it has a commercial value. Um, the other thing you've got to think of is, you know, in, and, and we have spoke to the Railroad Commission and also um, to the GLO and a few other different departments around, um, you know, Texas over the, the last 12 months. And, one of the other things you've got to think about is that because of the the, the leverage of, um, shall I say, relaxed regulations in Texas, uh, you know, for a few thousand bucks a year, you can become an operator and buy wells and, and take ownership of wells uh, quite easily in the state of Texas. So what, that is, what that's done is raised um, possibly lots of uh, liability um obligations or potential liability obligations on the on the government in Texas or the state of Texas in the case that somebody who owns them wells can't afford to pay for the abandonment or the decommissioning of them wells at some point which then means that that liability has to go onto the state which evidently goes on to the taxpayer okay so did you um, say so three, did you say three uh, one to three gigawatts per well yeah it's about half a half no it's about oh, half, half. A, half a megawatt yeah, well. Okay. So for 6,000 well. Yeah, 6,000 wells. In Texas, yeah. we consume 300, 365.1 terawatts. Does that make sense? Per annum. Right. Is that per annum or? I think that's per annum. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. So, so yeah, if you, if you, I mean, it's 6,000 and we can say we got half a megawatt well, and that's sort of three gigawatts of energy roughly from uh, if you're in megawatt sort of talk. So, and that's gigawatt hours. So, you know, you multiply that by 350 days, 24 hours a day, and that gives you a terawatt, that will give you terawatt hours per, per year. Um, okay. So, the, but, but my point my point here is, it's like, you know, we have, you know, there's a potential liability that sits uh, in them 6,200 wells. If, for example, the owner or the, the operator of wells at some point fails to have the ability or the means to decommission them wells, and it could be, you know, any, you know, we, we always assume that it's, uh, you know, one of the large companies that owns these wells, but there's a lot, you know, there's probably more wells owned by smaller players collectively than there is big companies put together. So, you know, there's a lot of wells that are there potentially who are owned by farm owners or landowners who, you know, have bought sites or bought wells with some good intention, um, you know, going forward that may be sitting there with a the liability that it may not be able to comply with at some point moving forward and if they don't comply with that liability of plug and abandonment you know ultimately the state is going to be responsible for that liability and ultimately the taxpayer is going to be responsible for that liability so um i think the ability to be able to use these um assets which have obviously had a lot of money put in them it's not cheap to drill an oil well so you know at some point in the past somebody has spent tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars in millions of dollars in some cases to drill these wells where they've produced energy out them for a period of time before they have closed them. And then wells are sitting there with a per probably perfectly good, uh, you know, life in them to at least last another 10, 15, 20 years. So if you can carry on that life and generate energy out of them and help to decarbonize or help to reduce the energy impact, um, in, in Texas for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, um, there, you know, it, it makes perfect sense to do that. So 
you know, we, we've been having conversations with local companies now about, you know, repurposing wells to actually provide energy into local communities, could be schools, could be hospitals, could be industry, you know, many, many places, even Tesla, you know, at the end yeah. of the day, we, if, he, if Elon Musk listens to this at some point, give us a shake because we could uh, give you some, some nice clean energy for some oil wells. Yeah. But, you know, the bottom line is, you know, we have to, we have to do it. We have to, um, you know, um, jump on the case and, and get moving with this because, uh, you know, as, as fast as there's uh, 6,000 wells this year, there'll probably be another few hundred added to that right. next year and so on. So, so how much, um, just, just off the top of your head, how much of the energy do you think that that geothermal could supply to Texas, like percentage wise, in an, in an ideal world? So the next in 10 years from now, could, what do you envision? I mean, off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly what the gigawatt energy supply is for Texas per day. But, um, you know, we're looking at the capacity of, I mean, you know, Texas is, when I look at Texas, I think it's the ninth largest economy in the world. So Texas to me is like looking at a country. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see, I've got a couple of numbers here. So it says 365.1 terawatts per year. So that's a pretty easy 365 days in a year. That's one terawatt per day. Does that make yeah, sense? So that's a, a big energy use. So yeah, so that's 10% you know, of the energy. total, that's 10% of the US's total energy use. Yeah. yeah. I think the benefit of Texas is that you know, Texas is an oil state. So I think with the the combined effort of the supply chain and uh, I mean this is not certainly not something that Serafi could do alone, but certainly happy that uh, Serafi uh, be part of the solution. And you know, I think you know what we're what we want to do as a company is is with our technology and our ability to provide that technology under license is, is really use the expertise of the, the, the companies in Texas, um, i.e. the bigger companies to actually roll out the, the, the decarbonization process and use of, uh, of our technology along with others to provide the solution. Right. So I think, you know, this is, this is never gonna be a, a Seraphy energy uh, solution on our own. And, you know, we don't ever, envisage that we're going to be the, the right. company that solves only solves a problem we you know we want to be part of the solution and as as much as we're doing efforts as other companies doing efforts out there and we want to make sure that you know we're part of that game i think the big uh the daunting thing is that you know if if we threw everything at it today uh we probably still fall short of achieving targets for 2050 um and and that's my honest opinion i think uh, you know, if we had, if if we, if I just think about how many drilling rigs there are in the world and what we need to do today to drill wells to actually decarbonize the future, even with geothermal, there's probably not enough um, wells or resources in the world today currently to even meet the challenge of 2050. So it's it's quite a daunting, daunting task when we actually look at the real realistic um, approach uh, to do this and. Also, the fact is about scale. It's um, you know scalability is all all down to money being made available to to activate the resources available to actually do something. Right. Um, you know, if money is not made available uh, to the point where it becomes a a continual bag of uh, funds to solve the problem and to generate this or create the solution, a scalable solution. It's never going to be fault, you know, and unfortunately, you know, this is where we are. It's like, um, unfortunately, our demand for energy is far outweighs our deep pockets to pay for the installation of clean energy. Uh, and that's the, that's for me is the staggering anomaly uh, in the, yeah, <laughs> in the yeah. process. Um, it, is, it, is, it is changing. I mean, it's slowly changing. You know, we get, we're seeing a lot more uh, investment now today in, in clean energy a lot more sort of pulling away from fossil fuel investment. Um, you know, that will change moving forward to an extent. It won't stop. It can't stop because we still need fossil fuels and we still need to um, develop fossil fuels for other things. But I think the decarbonization of energy and the non-funding of energy for fossil fuels is certainly a, a movement in its process now. And it's not going to take a U-turn in the future. It's going to carry on down that road. Um, I would like to see far more done from an investment point of view, getting behind um, not just technologies, but companies like us who are trying to make an impact change and trying to drive a solution. There's plenty of us out there. I think there's more companies out there that 
really do need support um, and and funding. And I think funding's key to all of this. You know, right. to to make a change, it needs funding, and uh, and that funding has to come with some commercial return. Uh, I don't think it's going to be the commercial return ever that people have uh, enjoyed from oil and gas over the last 30, 40 years. Uh, it's a different type of return. Right. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a slower return, but a more ethical and, uh, should I say, uh, we're fixing a problem. Yeah, <laughs> we're not, no longer term, yeah, so longer term solution. I mean, it's, yeah, you're, you're not just bandaging it, you're actually supplying a long-term solution. Um, yeah. That's great. I, I know, um, I really believe in what you guys are doing, even if, you know, in 10 years, if Texas could be producing 10% of its energy from geothermal, I think that would be a, that would be, you know, phenomenal. That That's about what the energy mix is right now in Texas is, you know, it's 10% or 11% coal. Um, actually, it looks like we export energy still for the, well, know how that is you annual use compared to production whether that's just waste but um it's you know 10 percent 11 percent coal 14 percent natural gas 10 percent motor gasoline 12 percent distillate fuel you know so f three percent ethanol um you know so it'd be nice to get geothermal in that mix i mean it's again it's just to, to me it's about redundant systems, building clean systems, consumer demand, I believe absolutely, you know, is going to drive this ever bit as much as it drives, drove Amazon's growth. You know, it, yeah. you know, every time, it seems like every time the marketeers and the Wall Street and everybody try to get out in front of things and predict things, it, it's always comes back to consumer drive. Like, Wall Street didn't know what Amazon was going to do 15 years ago because they couldn't see the consumer demand, the pent up consumer demand for that service is as simple as that. The consumers went crazy for it and it's happening with Tesla. It's happening and every time Wall Street tries to predict and get out in front of, you know, that it's, it's all comes back to the, what do the consumers want? You know, that's what our capitalistic systems are built around. And I do believe the education you know, it's getting better. People are starting to be concerned about these things, about clean environments. And we are seeing, you know, we, we have the most obese society in the world. And, you know, these are the results of this kind of fat cat American ideology that we've been running off of for, for so many years and, and not paying for the true consequences. You know, we have all these unintended consequences and, and we're not accounting for them. And, and just kind of need your, you know, sweeping them under the proverbial rug, literally, you know, with the, with the injection wells and with the nuclear waste and with, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just, it, we need to just start accounting for those things. To me, it's, 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 it's hard to do, but once we do that, I believe the funding will come. The funding will, will follow if, if we can start accounting for, for the true costs and, and then the scale of, you know, Tesla's showing what we can do with scale. You know, once the consumers yeah. get behind it and then you can scale it up, then all of a sudden, you know, storage makes, is starting to make a lot of sense if it's at a half the price it is right now, which it will be in five years, the way things are going, it, 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 probably less. It might be, you know, a quarter of the price it is right now at that point in time. So then all of a sudden storage does become a, a viable solution you still have to have a closed loop system for the for the mining of the rare earth minerals and the batteries and but in theory first principles wise it's possible you mine once and then all of those materials are recyclable if the systems are set up and the consumers are charged for the full the full closed loop system and and up front so um i really appreciate what you have to say do you have anything any anything in conclusion, we've been about an hour and a half here, hour and 15 minutes. So I want to actually a little longer, hour and 40 minutes. So I want to wrap up. I know you need to get back to work and I need to do the same. No, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, but what, uh, any conclusions about the future and promise and young kids, like anything that we can leave with our future generations or something of, of that you've learned or? Yeah, I think, I mean, as a closer message, I think, uh, I think, you know, I think, we have to be a lot more conscious about how we how we buy and what we use and 
and and I think you know if we individually all want to make a slight impact on the future just doing that on a daily basis um you know is, is going to make a big change and it's uh, you know it's, it, it is consumers that are going to change this process uh, it's not going to be oil companies it's not going to be greenpeace it's not going to be governments it's not going to be anyone else's consumers will change and will dictate what happens in the future and, and what actually either ends climate change which i don't think it will ever end i think you know climate change is a mixture of different things it's uh, we use the word very freely um i think you know it's been a bit of a catchphrase now but you know decarbonization is probably the better word for it because we need to decarbonize a lot more uh, our world we live in um and as a result of that decarbonization we should have some or should see some future impact on the the effects on climate moving forward and the, you know and how that affects the future of the, the going forward but I, I think we've gone beyond the point where you know we have um a very short time fix to a problem we, you know we just need to see now what we do in the next 20 30 years um how that's done and how in the following 20 30 years that then affects moving forward you know and i think you know if we can just cut out the, the, you know the carbon emissions and uh, and reduce our, our our own carbon footprint individually um, to more more of a sustainable um, process, you know that would have a big impact. And I you know I don't, and you don't have to be rich, you don't have to be you know of any form of category to make an impact change. You just have to make a decision and say you know I'm not going to do this anymore, or I'm not going to do that, or I'm going to do this differently. And, and that's enough. That's all you have to do. Um, and that's what, you know, individually we've sort of made an impact and, and a, you know, a pact between us in, in the founders of um, Seraphy to do is that, you know, we we want to make a change. Um, you know, we, we, we've decided to do this because we have the, the influence and the, the background knowledge and the experience to be able to do it. It's not driven, you know, by money it's not driven by an ethical point to actually you know do anything specifically to generate a revenue for money because we know by doing it it will naturally create a revenue um okay. so it's not it, it's like really a, an ethical process which has a a more or less a guaranteed no right. fail um end well, result no. if you get it wrong yeah, it's a big job creation story as well. And I love the point that you made of, um, you know, the skill sets. I've always said that, like, in Texas, like, we're, we're experts at drilling and, and x-raying the land, you know, like, we're, there's there's nobody better in the world in that than that than putting out oil well fires, you know, <laughs> like, we're, Absolutely. We're, we're really good at, at those things. And if we can take the skill sets you know, from the younger generations and, and continue to pay these kids, you know, 60, 70, $80,000 a year, even coming out of high school. That's why these kids work out in the, in the oil fields because um, they can make that kind of money, but we've, we can transition their skill sets into, um, you know, this, this renewable energy fields that you know, everybody's better off as a result of it. And I think there's a lot of, i after studying permaculture and becoming yeah, a teacher and, and certified in permaculture. I, and it's there's an energy aspect of permaculture. It's it's all about systems and best you know best practices, and that's that's why we wanted to start this podcast, or I wanted to start it, is because the energy aspect is so important. I mean, it's it's everything. It's solar energy coming down and the the plants you know that I grow in my backyard, the vegetables capturing that energy and producing food energy which goes into my body which is energy you know it's it's literally e, e equals mc squared you know it's it's everywhere around us it's it's everything and then and, and so it just seems like there are so many there are a lot better solutions and and one of the things i concern myself with is the health of our collective ecology you know we're as humans it's it's a bit of a humanistic point of view you know, because the roaches are going to be fine. <laughs> you know, like, like the the earth really doesn't care what we do. The earth's going to be fine. It's really the yeah. future generations and and the ecology which within which humans thrive that is at stake here. Not just not just humans, but 
but um, you know, all animals, right? All of our, our dynamic existence uh, on uh, life on Earth, and this idea that we might be, you know, heading towards a, you know a human-induced, you know, cataclysmic, um, you know, um, extinction event for the first time yeah. in the history of the Earth. Like this is a, a problem, you know, as far as is human survival and 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 moving forward for future generations and so um i appreciate you guys seeking this for the solutions i i, I certainly believe in you, the same thing with you carl it, this is not anybody's problem the more we sit around and point fingers you know it's nobody's fault it's everybody's problem <laughs> you know the more we yeah. sit around and point fingers the less time we're spending solving the problem and and so but I do think it's important to recognize there's a problem and, and, and collect data and pay attention to the science and see how we can you know, improve and do these things better. So I say welcome to Texas, Seraphie. And if there's anything that we can do to help, um, if there's anything that we can you know, lobby for or, or anything that we can do here um, on the ground, I know we, we're gonna have another conversation about producing media for you guys. I, I do believe there's a big disconnect. I think it's hard for people to get their heads wrapped around what it is because we can't see it. It's kind of like all yeah. the fracking, like we didn't really know what was going on with fracking because we can't see it. You know, you have to, yeah. we have to uh, illustrate these things and make these things, uh, put them into, you know, very palatable and, and on message graphics and photos and, and videos. And so I really look forward to helping you guys, my team helping you guys bring that message to the forefront and to kind of, I believe there's a divide there and I, I think that we can help and I'm, I really look forward to that. And uh, just keep doing what you're doing, Carl. It's been very insightful. We appreciate you on our, our, our first episode of Earth Repair and Energy. I think we're gonna label them 001. So you would be our, our 001. Cause I don't think we're gonna be able to do more than nine, 999 in my lifetime, <laughs> but maybe we might have to go to the next level. But um but thank you so uh, we, much I, mean, I, I appreciate you guys as well for um for giving me the benefit of, of doing this and uh you know at the end of the day we you know we, we see we do certainly see uh you know texas as being a, a you know the right the right um should i say step in into the into the us is it's um you know with the, the expertise that's currently there and uh you know we, we you know we built off we'll build off the back of that and uh along with others and uh hopefully collectively will uh, help with a transition and a process, you know. And it, it tends to be a little bit quicker to move here in the state of Texas. We can move quicker because of the, the you know, kind of explorative spirit. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, that's a good thing. Like we don't want to squash, uh, you know, in, in innovation. And that's, that's always been a, a, a thing that we're proud of in Texas. And, and so we welcome you guys with open arms and we really want to, yeah, I think you'll, you'll find that there's more people looking for solutions than trying to stay in the past and saying everything's okay, especially after the rolling blackouts. And, you know, we were, from what I understand, we were about this far from the system totally shutting down and it would have taken them maybe a month or two to get the system yeah. back up. And we, we really just kind of scraped by. So I, I think there's a lot of smart people like yourself here in Texas that are working really diligently and vivaciously on the, on these, there was some vigor on these, on these issues. I think Neil's one of them, you know, he's, oh, yeah. he sees that, you know, time is of the essence. So let's get busy um, resolving these issues. Yeah, we, I mean, we've already connected. We have a lot of allies around uh, Texas to the U S generally, and, you know, um, globally as well. And, you know, again, this is not a one man mission, a one company mission. This is everyone just doing doing their own thing doing a little bit but trying to do it all in the same direction so we're we're not pulling against each other we're pushing forward and uh, getting things done you know right well you're always welcome to you always have a, a bedroom and a kitchen and a place to stay and and fresh right. vegetables and, and a walk in the garden <laughs> if you're ever in central texas so look us up and well, I'm happy to do that. all right we'll we'll stay in touch thank you carl um everybody that's watching thank you so much like uh, push that subscribe button and let us know what you think. Um, I'm going to try to answer every question and follow up. If there's anybody 
in the industry. I can only do it from my perspective as kind of a, a, a visual asset maker and creator and, and creative, but uh, we're going to keep bringing people, uh, experts, engineers like Carl on, and, and we really appreciate what you're doing and moving forward. And um, that's all for today. We'll see y'all next time. All right. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank Bye -bye. you, Carl.